Hello, welcome back to lecture number four. So in today's lecture, we're going to consider systems having variable masses. So up until now, we have worked on various problems while using the Newton's second law of motion to find our equation of motions. So we used F equals to m dv over dt. Now this equation Let's consider a vector equation. This particular equation is true if our mass m is a constant. However, as the lecture name itself mentions that we are going to consider systems having variable mass, then in such a case, this mass is not going to be a constant. It will be a function of time. And in that case, we cannot use this particular form of Newton's second law. So does this mean that this uh, Newton's second law is incorrect? That is actually not the case. The actual definition of Newton's law is that the force applied on a body is directly proportional to the rate of change of momentum, which is dp vector over dt. And we know that the momentum is given by d over dt of mv vector. So this is the form that we are going to use to find our or write our equations of motions in today's lecture. So let's begin. Or in order to understand uh, the systems having variable mass, we are going to consider three extremely important problems in today's section. So we will consider a problem. So the first problem will be the falling raindrop problem through a stationary cloud. Right. Then we'll consider the second problem a balloon that rises up by dropping some sand from it. Then in the third case, we're going to consider the problem of a conveyor belt where it's carrying some mass. Okay, let's start with the first problem, the problem of falling raindrop through a stationary cloud. So let us consider a cloud and this cloud is stationary. It's not moving, so that means the velocity of this particular cloud as a function of time is equals to zero. Now we are also going to consider a raindrop. That's a raindrop of mass m. And this mass is going to be variable in nature. The reason being, or as the rain drops under the influence of gravity, it is going to absorb moisture from the atmosphere, moisture from the cloud. And because of that, it's going to gain its size and so it's going, it's going to gain its size as well as mass. That's why this m is going to be a function of time. It's going to be time dependent. So as time increases, the mass is also going to vary. Now, we'll say that this uh, particular raindrop is moving downwards under the effect of gravity with a velocity of v of t. Now, we'll see that what we are trying to do in this particular problem is we are going to consider two time stamps. So we'll have the initial time t and then we're going to consider another time uh, t plus delta t. That means after a short period of time delta t, what is the new momentum in gained by this raindrop? So initially, the raindrop is going to have a momentum of m of t times v of t plus now there's also one more thing so let's consider the mass of the cloud which is also m of t now this is also going to be a function of time that means here we have to take into consideration the conservation of mass and that means the whatever mass has been gained by the raindrop was actually lost by the uh, cloud that means we have m of t but since this is stationary the cloud is not moving at all so it will be simply m times v the velocity will be zero so this is our initial momentum initial total momentum of the system now after some time delta t has elapsed a very short period of time then in the time t plus delta t what will be the new momentum the new total momentum so we know that initially the mass was m so after a time delta t has elapsed this mass has been gained by the raindrop so that will be m plus delta m so this is the new mass multiplied by the new velocity so the velocity will be v initially it was v now it has also gained more velocity because of more mass so that will be v plus delta v 
added to what will be the mass of the cloud so that means initially it was m and later on it lost another mass which will be delta m this amount was lost multiplied to the new velocity which is still zero because the cloud is not moving at all it's stationary that means the total momentum of the system is so we multiply it we have m times v plus m times delta v plus v times delta m plus delta m times delta v and the initial momentum will be simply m v the primary objective is to obtain the equation of motion and for that we have to use newton's second law which is force is proportional to the rate of change of momentum that is we have to calculate dp over dt and for this we are going to use the definition of a derivative which is limit delta t approaching zero this is a very small amount of time we have p of t plus delta t minus p of t whole divided by delta t so that should give us limit delta t approaching zero we have 1 over delta t times so p of t plus delta t is this particular value minus mv so that will leave us with m times delta v plus v times delta m plus delta m times delta v however this change in mass and the change in velocity is so small that the, the product is also going to be further too small so we are going to neglect this product uh, that will leave us with limit delta t approaching zero so we have m times delta v divided by delta t plus uh, v times delta m divided by delta t now when we apply the limits so what we'll get is m times the so del delta v over delta t which will limit delta t goes to zero is dv over dt plus v times dm over dt so this is going to be the external force or dp over dt so this is how we have obtained the equation of motions like you could say like why take this long road we already know that the momentum of the body is given by m times v and if we take the derivative of both sides dp over dt so if we use the product rule that gives essentially the same result m times dv over dt plus v times dm over dt but we are not going to take this mechanical approach we have to use the approach that we just talked about where we find out the momentum initial momentum and the final momentum and use the definition of the derivative of momentum to obtain the equation of motion uh, and not directly use the product rule so this will become evident in the next problem let's move on to the second problem in the second problem we have a balloon that's rising upwards assume that this particular balloon is filled with some lighter gas which is hydrogen or helium and because of that it's rising upwards and this rise is due to the buoyant force now as the balloon goes up and up in the atmosphere what will happen like let's say this is our ground now further it's away from the ground then the air in the atmosphere is going to go thinner and thinner and because of that the buoyancy which is the buoyant force let's call it the buoyant force this is going to decrease over time and there will be some point when the balloon will be stationary that's because the buoyant force is getting balanced the buoyant force is getting balanced exactly by the gravitational force f of g so, so in order to further rise up what is done is like this balloon is carrying some amount of mass and little by little some mass is being thrown away so that it gets more lighter and lighter and what happens as the entire balloon gets lighter is going to again go further up we will derive the equation of motion so let's assume that initially that the mass of our balloon is m of t and it is moving upwards with a velocity of v of t so that means at time t d 
the momentum will be p of t so that will be simply mass of the balloon times the velocity with which it is moving next what we're going to do we're going to find out the momentum after a particular time let's say if a delta t amount has elapsed and then we want to check out what's the new momentum so the new momentum will be now what happens like as it goes up and up what we have done we have released some amount of mass let's say delta amount delta m amount of mass has been released so the new mass will be m minus delta m multiplied by the velocity here velocity has increased because now it's again moving upwards so there will be a little added velocity so v plus delta v now we also have to add another momentum which is the momentum of the mass of the object or the mass of the sand that was thrown away from the balloon so that is exactly the delta m amount which was which got thrown away from the balloon this will get multiplied to it's the same velocity v plus delta v because the mass that this mass delta m that is being released is also at the same relative speed as the balloon so that means the velocity will be v plus delta v so solving for this we have m v plus m times delta v minus v delta m plus v delta m plus delta m times delta v so negative v delta m and positive v delta m will cancel out each other we are left with m v plus m times delta v here again infinitesimal amount of mass multiplied to that infinitesimal amount of velocity the product is extremely small so we can neglect the term so therefore the rate of change of momentum dp over dt will be limit delta t approaching zero so we have p of t plus delta t so that will be mv plus m times delta v minus p of t the initial momentum whole divided by the fraction of time which is delta t so here mv and mv gets cancelled and we are left with mass times limit mass uh, delta t approaching zero multiplied to delta v divided by delta t so that's simply m times dv over d t so this is the equation of the force so that means the external force will be equals to m times d v vector over d t now if we had started with p equals to m times v and took the derivative with respect to time then we would have ended up with one more extra term which is m dv over dt plus v dm over dt now see the second term v times dm over dt is not present in the final equation of the external force so we need to be extremely careful here and this external force f of xt it's uh, it's the fight between the upward thrust versus the downward gravitational forces let's come to the third problem this is the case of a conveyor belt so what we have here is a conveyor belt with some fixed frictionless ruler attached to it and this is moving from left to right with some velocity v of t now we are also presented with a, a hopper a hopper is a sort of a mixer that takes in different elements combine them and convert them into a one common mixture it's uh, releasing some mass delta m into the conveyor belt as it moves the conveyor belt as it moves from left to right then a fraction of time delta t now let's set up the problem so at time t so that means initially the momentum before even the sand or the material drop on the conveyor belt so we had delta m equals to zero that means no material was falling on the conveyor belt so that means the 
momentum initial momentum will be 0 times v so that's equals to 0 since our delta m mass is 0 now after a fraction of time that's let's say delta t time has elapsed then we have the final momentum will be delta m times the velocity v so that means our momentum will be dp over dt is equals to limit delta t approaching zero and the difference pt plus delta t minus pt will be simply delta m times v divided by delta t and when we take the limit we get v dm over dt so that means our external force f external will be equals to v vector times dm over dt so that is the equation of the motion so this equation is the equation of the sand that falls on the conveyor belt and starts moving as it falls on the conveyor belt and that is given by f external equals to velocity times rate of change of mass so let us now work on a few numerical problems to help, that will help us understand the three scenarios. Problem number one. So a raindrop begins to fall from rest through a stationary cloud due to gravity. So we have a stationary cloud and there's a raindrop that's going to fall under the influence of gravity and throughout this process as it falls down through the cloud what is happening the raindrop is going to gain mass that's true because the raindrop is uh, gaining moisture it's absorbing this is true because the raindrop is absorbing moisture from the cloud so it's going to gain some mass that's given that as it gains mass that rate of change of mass is proportional to the product of its instantaneous mass and velocity and so that means it's given that the rate of change of mass let's assuming that uh, it starts with a mass of m as a function of time t so this will be e equals to some constant a times mass times velocity so let's state it as equation number one now we need to determine an equation of motion for this particular raindrop as it falls through the atmosphere and also we need to create an expression for the raindrop's terminal velocity if we read this question again we'll observe that luckily we do not have any kind of resistive force available but yet we'll still be able to find an expression for the terminal velocity so we begin by first constructing the equation of motion we know that for a raindrop that falls through the stationary cloud we already obtained the external force f external is given by m dv over dt plus v dm over dt now let's substitute the value of equation one into our force equation so we have f external so that will be simply mg which will be equals to m dv over dt plus v times so dm over dt is a times mass times velocity here the value of the external force is considered to be positive mg so we have to be careful here so like before solving the problem we have to set a reference position so let's assume that the raindrop stops drops below this reference position so that means this is as it falls downwards so the force will be positive so that's why we have positive energy so this is a very important uh, this should be set up before even starting the problem now that we have this equation let's write the equation in terms of dv over dt so we we have m times dv over dt is equals to mg minus a m v squared now let's divide 
let's divide both sides by m so we have dv over dt is equals to g minus a v squared which is the required equation of motion now for the second part in order to obtain the terminal velocity we need to set dv over dt equals to zero and that gives us zero equals to c g minus a v t squared where vt is the terminal velocity g over a and we have square root so this is the expression for the terminal velocity terminal velocity now although in this problem we do not have any resistive force present but if we look at the rate of change of mass the dm over dt so it's a function of velocity v and because of this it's acting like there's a it's acting like a resistive force that means it's uh, here it's acting like a force which is against which is going against the downward going force that is the gravitational force problem number two so here we have a freely moving water droplet that is evaporating continuously we need to calculate the velocity of this water droplet as a function of time assuming that the net momentum carried away by the vapor vanishes and that the rate of evaporation is proportional to the surface area there are lots of things mentioned here so let's tackle the problem one by one so we have unlike a water droplet now unlike the previous problem where it was falling through a stationary cloud it was gaining moisture but in this case the moisture is going to go away because it is evaporating also it's mentioned here that it's evaporating in all direction and what happens is like every time a water molecule leaves the sphere's surface let's say it's a living the sphere water molecule leaves the sphere's surface it's going to carry some momentum with them that is going to have some kind of velocity view with it but it's mentioned here that the dispersion is even from all direction that means the net momentum is going to be equals to zero because all the velocities cancel out or all the momentums acting in the opposite direction cancels out each other hence the evaporation process is not going to exert any force on the droplet now we try to find out the equation of motion so let's start with at time t that's the initial time we consider the starting point so at time t the mass of the raindrop is m and its velocity because it's moving so let's say it is moving with some velocity v which is a function of time right then what happens after some time has elapsed let's say after delta t amount of time so after delta t amount of time that is t plus delta t at this particular time the new mass of the raindrop will be m minus delta m so we need to subtract delta m amount of mass because it is evaporating so it's definitely it's losing some mass the velocity will be velocity will be v plus delta v however since we do not know whether delta v is positive or negative so we are considering it as plus delta v so delta v could be positive or negative now also the radius the radius of the rain drop initially if it was r then the new radius will be r minus delta r right so let's define the momentum the momentum initially as a function of time will be simply m times v and after t plus delta t time period the new momentum v of t plus delta t will be m minus delta m whole multiplied to v plus delta v such that the rate of change of momentum dp over dt 
will be equals to limit delta t approaching 0. So we have pt plus delta t. So that is simply mv plus m times delta v minus v. So let's consider a vector. All this where v velocities are vectors. So we have m times delta v vector minus v vector times delta m plus del then we have negative delta m times delta v which we are not considering because it's a, the product will be extremely small minus p of t which is mv all divided by delta t so the mv and mv gets cancelled and when we solve this we should get m times dv over dt so v vector minus v vector times dm over d t so this is our external force so dp over dt is the external force acting on the raindrop which is equals to m d v vector over dt minus v vector times dm over dt however in the question it's mentioned it's a freely moving water droplet so freely moving means there has no external force that is being applied on this particular water droplet so we have f external so this is equals to zero that means now our equation is simply given by m dv vector over dt minus v vector dm over dt is equals to zero so this is a equation of motion we will solve this differential equation to do that let's differentiate both sides so let's rewrite this equation by variable separation method so we have d v vector divided by v vector is equals to dm divided by m so we have a variable separate uh, separation form now we're going to integrate both sides so the left side of the integral the limits will be starting from the initial v0 to v and mass initially it was m0 then after evaporation it becomes mass m so we have natural log of v vector so it's, that's the integration of 1 over v with respect to dv with the limits going from v0 to v0 uh, v vector equals to natural log of the mass m with limits going from m0 to m so we should get natural log of v vector divided by v0 vector which is equals to natural log of m divided by m0 if we take the anti logarithm on both sides so we will have v vector divided by v0 vector so that's equals to m divided by m0 or simply v vector is equals to v0 vector multiplied to m times m0 however this is not the end of the solution although we were asked to find out the velocity so let's look at the question so we have to find out the velocity of the drop as a function of time we have only found out the velocity now we also need to show that this is actually a function of time now for that we need to have this particular mass this mass must be a function of time if we can show that this is a function of time then essentially our velocity vector v is also going to be a function of time right now we look at the another hint that is given in the problem so let's look at the question here it's said that the rate of evaporation is proportional to the surface area let's use this fact let's mention here that the rate of evaporation is proportional to the surface area of the drop so that means if we have the mass m so dm over dt is proportional to the surface area so surface area will be 
4 pi 4 pi times r square where r is the radius of the raindrop how oh, that means dm over dt that will be equals to negative c times 4 pi r squared where c is some constant of this is a constant of proportionality and the negative sign indicates evaporation evaporation that is decrease in size of the raindrop decrease in size of raindrop fine we also know that mass of the raindrop will be given by m is equals to the volume which is 4 over 3 pi r squared times the density this is the density of water this is the mass of the rain so if we take the differentiation with respect to time so we will have dm over dt so that will be 4 by 3 pi rho these are all constant and uh, this is r cubed this is r cubed that's the volume of the raindrop so differentiation of r cubed with respect to time t will be 3 r squared times dr over dt or that's simply the 3 and 3 gets cancelled so we have 4 pi r squared times rho times dr over dt so this is dm over dt and we also obtain that dm over dt is equal to negative c times 4 pi r squared so let's equate both of them so we have 4 pi r squared rho times dr over dt and that's equal to negative c times 4 pi r squared so 4 pi r squared gets cancelled from each both sides and that leaves us with dr over dt is equals to negative c over rho so we have negative c over rho now let's write in terms of differentials dr is equals to negative c over rho which are both constant c and rho times dt and we integrate both sides so initially we have the radius r naught and that became finally r at a time starting from 0 to t so that means r radius r with a limit going from r naught to r equals to negative c over rho times t and the limit going from 0 to t solving for the limits we have r minus r naught is equals to negative c over rho times t or simply r is equals to r naught minus c over rho t so this is the expression for the radius of the raindrop the negative sign that means indicates that the rain radius of the raindrop is decreasing because we can clearly see that when t is equals to zero that means initially the raindrop was exactly equals to r naught the initial value and now as time increases this is going to decrease r is going to be lesser than r naught now we need to do one more thing we'll take the ratio the final mass of the raindrop uh, divided by the initial mass m naught so that simply equals to the final mass is simply 4 by 3 pi r cube times the density of water rho divided by the initial mass m naught which is 4 over 3 pi r naught cube times the density rho or simply this is r over r naught whole cube now from this equation we can find r over r naught so we can divide both sides with r over r naught so that should give us r divided by r naught is simply 1 minus c over rho uh, r naught times t so let's substitute this so we have m over m naught is equals to 1 minus c over rho r naught times t whole cube then we are going to multiply both sides with v naught vector v naught vector and that's done because we know that v naught vector times m over m naught that's equals to 
a velocity v and we see that our velocity v is now truly a function of time because it has this time component here thus the velocity vector as a function of time is given by the initial velocity v naught times 1 minus t over t naught whole raised to the power 3 where uh, value of t naught is simply rho times r naught whole divided by c problem number three so here we have a balloon that has a constant mass of m and it has also got a bag of sand with some mass m naught uh, connected to this particular balloon so let's draw it out so we have a balloon of mass this mass is fixed this is m and to it we have attached another bag of sand who has a constant mass of m naught the thing is there is also a constant upward thrust of c that's given now when it is an when it is initially in equilibrium the sand is released at a constant rate mu releasing all of it in time t naught that means because of this upward thrust this balloon is going to ascend upwards now there will be a time when the upward thrust is exactly going to get balanced by the downward force which is uh, m g m plus m naught g m plus m naught times g this is the total force on the balloon now when this happens this is going to get balanced now because it's balanced what will happen the balloon is going to reach an equilibrium position it's neither going to come down or neither it is going to go upward neither it's going to come down nor it's going to go upward so what is done is like slowly uh, the sand is going to be released from its back with a constant rate of mu that means the new mass the mass m naught will be actually m naught minus alpha times t where t is like any uh, amount of time that has elapsed now what happens when this essentially goes to zero that means the mass is like completely let's say that at time t equals to zero at time t equals to t naught the entirety of the sand in the bag gets emptied that means m naught minus mu t naught is equals to zero which implies that the value of mu will be equals to m naught over t what we have to do is in this particular problem we need to construct the balloon's equation of motion so we know that for a balloon problem the external force f e external is given by mm, m times d v vector over dt so this external force is also a vector now the external force acting on the balloon is simply the downward force negative mg plus the upward thrust which is equals to m times d v vector over dt now here we, there's a reason why i have chosen a negative sign here negative mg that's the reason being here this is the reference position and this is ascending upwards so that's why since this is ascending upwards the downward force which is the gravitational force is acting downwards that's why we have a negative c and our velocity v which is in the direction of the upward thrust so that's why we have a positive thrust c let's get rid of the negative sign then we have m times d v over dt is equals to c minus mg dividing both sides by the mass so we have dv over dt is equals to c over m minus g now 
we need to uh, replace the value of C and M with appropriate values. So initially it was mentioned that the balloon is at equilibrium. So that means the upward thrust C is balanced by the downward force, which is M plus M naught times G. So that will go into the place of C. So replacing the value of C with M plus M naught type G, we have dv over dt is equals to m plus m naught times g divided by m minus g so this is going to be the equation of motion for the given balloon problem let's move on to the next problem problem number so here we have a stationary hopper that is discharging sand at the rate of 5 kilograms per second onto a conveyor belt that is in motion. The, the conveyor belt is connected with some frictionless rulers and it moves at a constant speed of 0.75 meters per second. And it's propelled by a constant horizontal external force, F of EXT, which is supplied by the motor that drives the belt. And so we are provided with a, a constant force, external force, and that makes the conveyor belt move with a constant speed of 0.75 meters per second. Now, what we need to do is we have two parts for this problem. The part one is we need to find out the horizontal rate of change of momentum for the sand and number b we have to find out the force of friction that is exerted by the belt the sand in order to do this problem let's quickly draw a diagram so that was going to help us understand what's happening the equation of motion for this particular problem is given by f external is equals to v vector dm over dt so we already have all the values so let's plug in this value so here the velocity vector is 0 0.75 meters per second multiplied to dm over dt so that is 5 kg per second so that should give us 3.75 newtons and this is essentially the rate of change of momentum, this external force, dp over dt, which gives the rate of change of momentum in the dp over dt, the rate of change of momentum is 3.75 newtons, which is the external force itself. Now moving on to the second part, we have to find out the force of friction, which is exerted by the belt, this particular belt on the sand. Now to find out the second part, the force of friction exerted by the belt on the sand, we need to understand the fact that this moment, this sand, hits the conveyor belt, it's not going to move. This can only happen if and only if the frictional force exerted by the conveyor belt on the sand is exactly, this is the direction of the frictional force, F frictional force, it's going to be exactly balanced by the force acting on the horizontal direction which is f external and only in that case the sand is not going to move so that means r frictional force is given by the force external and that's simply 3 point and that value is simply 3.75 newtons thank you